welcome to Stockholm and to the royal palace. In this day and age, royal families seem to make headline only when they get married or when the popular press blow scandals about their private lives. Here in Sweden, there are rumors, of course, and sometimes headlines, but the fact remains, the monarchy is very popular, and especially the queen, Queen Sylvia, by far the most admired and loved person in Sweden. Her Majesty the Queen has accepted to see us. Your Majesty, an American magazine ranked you among the 100 most powerful women in the world. But of course, in your country, in Sweden, you are the number one in terms of popularity. The Swedes love you, respect you. Why? <laughs> Thank you very much. Very kind of you to say that, to start. I wouldn't like uh, to talk about power. It's not a question of power, I, uh, I think, because I am... It's a word I would like to avoid. No, I mean, I'm... Why? Because it has bad connotations for you? Yes, because I don't feel that way. I'm, I'm married to, to a man I, I liked, and I tried to help him. And uh, I have wonderful children, I try to help them. I have a wonderful country, with lovely people, and, and I try to help them. So for me, it's not a question of having power or not. It's just that I am very happy to, to be here and to, to help them, yes. That, uh... Are you, we, we all know, of course, that uh, Sweden has a constitutional monarchy and has done so for a very long time. But nevertheless, given your role and the importance you have uh, for the Swedes. Do you follow politics at all? Are you interested in political issues as well as in social issues? Well, of course I'm interested in political issues and of course I, I follow it. I will not uh, discuss it in public, of course, but I meet uh, ministers and of course I, I talk to them and I ask them, but um, publicly I, I wouldn't, of course, pick up those uh, issues. But uh, I like to talk about my social interests, yes. In, in, in Europe, uh, our various countries, however different they may be, have now a series of problems in, in common having to do, for instance, uh, with immigration, and especially for women. Uh, in France, for instance, there is a law banning headscarves in schools. I know it's not the same here in Sweden, but how do you feel when, when girls uh, in schools wear burka, for instance? I, I think it, the problem has risen here in Sweden not long ago. It's interesting that you pick that uh, problem because the uh, I think today two years ago no last week uh, we had a discussion here in in, uh, in Stockholm about those questions and uh, and of course the government was very much involved in it as well and I was present there to follow the discussions and certainly about the immigration of women and uh, their situation for instance in Sweden. And, uh, and their family situation and the children, certainly the girls' situation here. And as you know, we had some uh, very uh, difficult cases, very tragic cases where uh, young girls have been killed by their family members because of uh, they perhaps have been too modern to emancipate it emancipated from the family or had a, a boyfriend which didn't belong to their community and uh, so of course that's a problem we have also in, in Sweden and in many other countries in, in Europe and also in Germany and uh, yes France and England uh, as well so we have been discussing 
uh, that issue very, very much. And uh, of course, this is something which you you can solve it from one day to the other. I mean, it um, it's not only it's more perhaps a cultural problem too. And. Um, but do you think our countries, and, and specifically this one, which of where the freedom of the individual is, of course, very important, but should there be a limit to um, the liberty of people coming from other cultures to actually follow their own rules and habits, and, and for instance, uh, imposing upon uh, little girls to wear Burkas, is, is that something which, in your view, is uh, compatible with a uh, see, European I mean, country? I, yes, um, I see those problems from another angle a little bit, because I've been living in Brazil so many years, and my father being German, and then I lived in Germany, my mother being Brazilian. So I have always been between two worlds. And of course, what I think it's uh, very important is that both sides are open to, to each other. And I think one should compromise and one should meet in the middle. You can't uh, have strictly your own culture in another country. You have to respect the other country's laws, the other country's culture as well. So you have to find a way to you know, to accommodate both sides. And, uh, and of course, it's not always easy, but it needs time to, to do that, and the will to do it. But do you believe that there should be a legal uh, system or some sort of government uh, decisions to establish the rules, or should it be left to people's will? Well, there you put me now into a very political discussion, which uh, I really wouldn't like to go into it. But uh, from my own point of view and experience, uh, having lived in, in that situation, I would say that uh, one has to, to compromise. You have been uh, very active for a long time now, uh, defending the rights and the welfare of children yes. all over the world, in Sweden, of course, but also in Eastern Europe, in Russia, in Brazil, where you lived for 10 years, I believe. Um, what is the, the, the achievement uh, that you are the most proud of in that respect? I think that I could help to bring up the problem of uh, the children's situation when it comes to sexual abuse and um, of street children into the light. This was a question which was and is in many countries still uh, taboo. Nobody talks about it or don't want to talk about it. So for 10 years ago when I started to talk about it, it was quite 
I think, shocking for, for many. And I must say, it wasn't easy for me to pick it up either. Well, um, why did you do so? Because we had a case here in, in Sweden, 92, 93, about uh, pedophile. And, and uh, it was the first time that we really saw that it was organized. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly, uh, unfortunately, it had certainly happened before as well, but not in an organized form as it did then. Because nowadays it's so easy to make your own video film about it. And it's all uh, over the world, of course, yes. with the networks yes, And it's so technically so easy now to make your own film about uh, sexual abuse of a child, and which is, of course, distressing and awful, but uh, um, so, and we were all so shocked in, in Sweden, and that's why I, in an international conference, I picked up that uh, subject. And, uh, and I was very happy that the Swedish government took the initiative in 1996 to organize a conference, the first world conference on exploitation of, of children, sexually exploitation of children. And it was um, ECPAT who was behind it. ECPAT is an organization who is fighting for the children's rights, and, and uh, they are doing wonderful, wonderful work. And um, so 122 governments were here. And at that time, some weeks before, there was this awful case of, in Belgium, which happened in Belgium of Dutro, if, if you remember, yes. And, um, yes, the trial just took place a few months ago. And uh, which was really terrible, and everybody was very shocked. So on the conference in Stockholm, I think the governments and NGOs got really together, and uh, they because they talked the same language, they were so shocked by what happened. And I think this was a very important step, and many governments changed their laws, inclusive Japan as well. Japan was very brave because not only that they changed their laws to protect their children, but they also organized the Second World Congress in Yokohama, which I also attended. And I must say they did a fantastic job. Of course, one wishes that we don't need such conference, but uh, I must say it, it, uh, it's very necessary to wake up people, to draw the attention, to make as an eye-opener and uh, so uh, that, I think that was my, uh, my most important uh, task. Is there any way to measure progress in such a worldwide, difficult, and of course secretive uh, well, aspect yes, of the problem? Yes, it's, it's, it's a very dark mm. side of humanity. And, um, in a strange way, you have now so many people working for that issue to, to help the children and so many organizations and goodwill and, uh, and somehow you have the feeling that it's accelerating. I mean, when you talk about trafficking, you have nearly two million who are women and children who are victims. In trafficking, which and of course is horrendous, yes, yes, and a very yes. profitable one, yeah. fortunately. But I must say, uh, there are lights in the tunnel too. If you think about the code of con conduct which uh, Ecpat International and UNICEF has, uh, as it was signed now in May in New York, mm -hmm. and uh, and there are big travel agencies who have signed the code of conduct. Many. Uh, agencies who have a pride that they are following the code of conduct against pedophile, against those, uh, yeah, business, you can say, against um, yeah, child pornography films and, and, uh, and also against hotels who are working and having that kind of service. Um, Your Majesty, you mentioned earlier that you are uh, half Brazilian, half German. Which half do you prefer? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Of course, now you're Swedish, so the, yes. the, the question is answered in a way. <laughs> yes, but 
I don't know. I, I, I hope I can unify all the three parts in my heart because, uh, of course, I, I have my, my roots both in, in, in Brazil and in Germany, and I was, of course, uh, influenced by the two countries and cultures, and of course. And, um, and I think it helped me a lot when I came to, to, to Sweden because I could see things in a different angle and I uh, saw it with other eyes, perhaps. And uh, so, which of course sometimes brings uh, new solutions, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I hope I could uh, bring all, everything I had and experience and, and uh, perhaps diplomacy as well, I don't know, to help my country now. But after all these years, is there still something which amazes you about the Swedes? Are you still surprised at uh, the way they behave? Or? I'm always um, astonished how balanced uh, Swedes are and how warm they are. Some yeah, Swedes also said to me, oh, we are uh, cold or we are strict. And I must say, I, I never find, find that. I, I, I always found a very kind attitude, very warm, very warm in their heart and, and in their friendship. So I, Don't they have any bad sides at all? Oh, of course, there are some who are <laughs> certainly bad sides. No, but in general, they are terribly kind and, and very nice people. It seems that, uh, and of course, Sweden is not the only country where it, it, it's taking place, but alcohol is becoming a very big problem in Sweden. What, in your view, would be the ways to try and um, limit or circumscribe the issue, which is very costly in terms of uh, public health, but, and of course yeah. in terms of individual lives. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think our modern way of life is also uh, accelerating uh, that problem. And uh, unfortunately, there are many uh, young people and many young girls who are drinking more and more and smoking as well. And uh, of course, this is something which we all are very worried about it. And uh, I'm working in an, um, with an organization called Mentor, and we try to do some work um, to prevent drug abuse and alcohol. And uh, so we have a, and it's doing, it's very interesting, it's, it's doing very well. Uh, or we asked the big companies to uh, involve their employees. And, uh, and I must say, they have been very open to, to that, so that the employees can become mentors. Mm -hmm. Of for other a year. people in the... Yes, for a year. And uh, so they, they, they get information and they take part on a, I say schooling, more or less. And, um, and they do it in the, uh, during their working time. Mm -hmm. So the, the companies have been very, very generous. And then they take, uh, they are together with young people who have problems. Uh, they are mostly 15, 16 years old. Many are uh, children from immigrants as well. They have problems perhaps in school. They have problems in the society. They have problems to to get acquainted in mm -hmm. the society, to find their own role in the society. Uh, sometimes they are together in gangs, and the peer group, uh, the pressure of the peer group is very big. And um, so during a year, I must say, they are doing a wonderful work, and let's say most of them, I would say eight out of 10, uh, get very well to go along with those young people and they become friends mm -hmm. and they help each other because the contact to adults I think is today a problem. The contact with the parents, sometimes only a lonely mother, sometimes the father doesn't exist 
And um, so to have the possibility to talk to a third person who is neutral in, in the feeling, they feel more liberty to speak openly, to ask for advice instead of a mother who is uh, worried and talking the whole time uh, about the problem and, and the child mm -hmm. doesn't yes, want to accept that. Easier to talk to yes. a third person. And uh, with a third person, it's easier to, to talk about those things. So they have done a wonderful work. So there are some banks who are doing that. There are some other companies. I don't want to make uh, propaganda now for them. No, but no <laughs> advertising. No advertising, but they are doing a wonderful work, I must say. And that's perhaps a way to, to help. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the government is doing a lot. Our Swedish government and the ministry. Um, but we, we try to, well, to help mm -hmm. with the prevention by, by having this mentoring program. You, you met your husband, I believe, in 1972 at the Munich Olympics. It must have been the only happy event in these games, which were scarred by uh, terrorism yes, well, at the yes, time. That's true. Um, did you have any idea that uh, what it would be like to actually marry a king? <laughs> of course not. But he gave would me... Would you have done so had you known? <laughs> but he gave me four years to think about it. So there were four years which I could think and I could feel and I could see how his life was. And uh, of course, I met his sisters then. And, but uh, of course, I could never imagine fully what it would be, of course not. But um, they were for very important years. And um, I must say the fact that I had worked six years within the Olympic Games, like Munich and Innsbruck, uh, gave me uh, some inner security. and. Uh, but the only thing I could say was, I will do my best. And uh, so that's uh, what I always tried. And um, so I, I really hope that I could be of some value and some help, yeah. Det var någonting som sa som man lärde sig klick. <laughs> Och sen det så har det sagt klick hela tiden. <laughs> You, you were a commoner, which okay. is not a, a very usual status among uh, European royal families. And yet with the younger generation, it seems that it is more and more uh, a fact that uh, in, the, in, the fa in these families in Europe, and after all, quite a few of those actually are still in office, so to speak, uh, young princes 
uh, have widened their horizon and marry people from all over the world. Is that something which you would wish for your own children? That's a question which everybody is uh, asking and, and wondering, of course. I think that, uh, I mean, you have to be willing to do the best you can. You have to be willing to be open to the not always easy life. Nowadays, of course, the press is very open and very aggressive. More and so than when you were married. More than in 1972, yes. In those years, I, of course, also had the feeling that the press was very interested. But, uh, but it, it was there's more a difference, in those yes. Days. There's a difference, yes. Um, and I think they should think that there's always a person behind when they are writing about a young person. That there are feelings, that there is a, uh, a young person who can be uh, very, let's say, not injured, but... Um, Touched. Yes, and, and, uh, and sad about what Somebody just writes, you know. And of course, even it has, things which are not true. And, and it has and happened so. with, with your children, of course, and yes, particularly well. with your yes, daughters. Yes. And so I think uh, the Royal Palace had to sue some German newspapers. Mm. Yes, unfortunately, that's something which I never thought would happen because mm. I don't have that attitude, and um, I have respect for the other person other person's professional profession and uh, and so also for 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 the media of course but um, when it comes to uh, you know that you are really destroying the good reputation of a young person i i think that's something very serious and um, and we try to balance that and uh, but then there was no end for their fantasy and how they were writing. So I hope they, they understand that um, we did it to, to save uh, our children's reputation. And to tell the world also that this was not true. And um, I hope they respect that. But, um, to come back to your question, I think it's very important that the person is willing to face that not always easy situation. What is um, the, the most, how could I put it, the most emotional moment of a life which after all is always or almost always under public scrutiny? And yet, uh, you have to do all sorts of terribly boring things. At least it seems to me from very far away. <laughs> A good friend of mine, she said once to me, there's nothing which is so boring that you can't listen to it. Well, because, that's a challenge. Yes, because if you don't do it, it gets even more boring. That's true. Yeah. And you will always find something interesting, even in the most boring people person who can tell you about her life or his life. And uh, destiny can't be boring. Well, yours certainly hasn't been boring. <laughs> well, no. No, it has been a very exciting life, I must say. And um, personally, but also professionally, very exciting. And because um, it's something it's always something new. Uh, there's no end of surprises and new adventures, new challenges, and uh, uh, new people, new ideas, new uh, things to discuss. So it's very, it's fascinating. But at the same time, 
obviously there isn't much freedom, not much freedom of expression, not much freedom of action even, or, or, or movement. So how, how does one live with that? You know, a movement that, that, for me personally, it's not uh, a problem. What I feel is difficult is that there's no freedom or possibility of flexibility, being flex flexible. You know, to say today I would like to go to see a film or to meet somebody. Uh, that's very difficult. To The decisions from one moment to the other, you know, that you just say, oh, now I would like to do this. That's more difficult, more how problematic. Long, how long in advance is your schedule organized? Well, for the big uh, questions, of course, a year, two years, when it comes to state visits and, mm -hmm. and big events. But um, And the routine? Routine, we have, well, I would say it's six months that we know exactly what we are doing next six months, yes. And, um, and then to change, that's not always very easy because then you are disappointing people who have been organizing it. Uh, they're expecting you to be there, you, you have said you would come. And, and so that makes it difficult to, to, to be as flexible as Queen Louise said once. It's very unpractical to be ill or dead. <laughs> <laughs> But have you managed to, to, how could I put it, to, to have your own time, so to speak, to, to have some moments of your own, on your own, away from it all? Not really, not really. I tried since 28 years now to have Monday as a free day, but it doesn't yes, you, happen I mean, very often. Be, I don't know, the Queen's uh, free day or something. Today, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but then there are things, uh, of course, which are important, so then there are exceptions. And sometimes the exceptions are very, very are happening very often, so it's difficult to keep a free Monday. But, um, but it's a wonderful, exciting life, very intensive. Isn't there moments of loneliness, though, being the prisoner of so many obligations? The loneliness between so many people, you mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, sometimes. Sometimes you can, can, can feel it. Yeah. It's um, lonely with decisions. You know, you can discuss things with uh, somebody you can uh, try to find a solution, but the decision is yours. And of course, it's always yours. But uh, in our case, it's um, there are de decisions which uh, goes into the future, and, and you don't know how your decision will develop. And um, historically, and uh, so it's, um, it's not always easy.
l'Union suédoise a clairement choisi Ni vet inte om jag lägger mig en politisk fråga här. You have three children who now are young adults, all of them. Yes. And the, the Swedish constitution was changed uh, after your first daughter was born, so that she, in turn, inherits the throne rather than your son. Do you think that was a good idea? Um, it's not easy to, to explain, but I'll try. Um, you see, when my husband was born, he had four sisters. So everybody was very nervous that he perhaps could also have been a, a girl. And um, so I think that's why one wanted to change that law, but also because it was the time of the women's lib liberation. Especially in Sweden. And especially in Sweden. So one really wanted to give the first child the equal possibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when Kafilip was born, he was uh, second then, our second child. And uh, so he was born crown prince. And, but in Sweden you have a law that uh, when you want to change the basic law, you have to have an election in between. So it means that two parliaments should decide upon I the see. same question, yes. And so when he was born, uh, and the second parliament then has decided, then he was, he, he was then seven months old. And, um, and I must say the, um, when they changed that law, the only thought I had was, well, the parliament and, and uh, the Swedish people, they, they want to change that law so that both my husband and I fully accept it. But the only thought I have was, um, I hope that Victoria would have time then to have her own family be before she, she becomes queen. Mm -hmm. Because it's quite, uh, it's a very intensive life. It's quite heavy, and um, and I know that she would do it beautifully. So that was never a question, and um, so that was a mother's thought at that moment. And uh, I know that she will do a, a wonderful, a wonderful job. And I know that the Bernadots get very old, so I'm very confident that she will have <laughs> all the time before she becomes queen. What most important advice went uh, a long time from today that actual day happens? What advice will you give her that day? I have seen her now uh, some time now um, being more active, being in public meeting um, many delegations and uh, and I must say I I fully admire her how she the way she does it in spite of her youth the way she talks to people she is interested the way she receives them and follow uh, the big questions I think she I think she's doing very well and I wish she continues to be as open as she is, as frank as she is. In and spite of all the pressure yes, on her own yes, life. Yes. And, um, and I know she, she will do it very well. 
So I'm, uh, I'm very proud of her. Given the fact that your oldest daughter will actually become queen one day, what do you think your other two children should do with their lives? Should they run away and do their thing in Brazil or some other place and escape from all of this? No, I don't think so. I think they should help her sister. I mean, uh, for her to carry the responsibility alone, it's, it's, it's tough. And, um, and I think uh, they're willing to, to take their, their part. Uh, but what I think it's important is that they have uh, their own uh, education that they do what they really feel for and what they love. So Kafilip now he's studying graphic design. Yeah. First he, um, he went through the military school, three years, so he's an officer. And I never forget the moment when his father gave him the sword. Mm. And uh, three years in the military, it's quite tough. I'm sure. And so he did that very well. And, uh, and then we said to him, now, why don't you do something you really want to do? And uh, so he has chosen graphic design, and he loves it. It's very far from the military. Yes, the very much so. And, uh, but he, he, he I, I think he's talented. And um, so I have seen some of his uh, ideas, what he is working with. And, so it's fun. It's great fun. A new and shape for it. the crown or something? Uh... Well, who knows? Not the crown, no. That, I don't think so. But uh, he, he has uh, excellent ideas, really. And the same thing we asked Madeleine to do what she really likes. And, and she likes uh, yes, she, she has many interests, but one of them is uh, of course, fashion, but um, but also culture. So she has, um, you see, and there's something which the papers never write because she has taken, for instance, there's um, a course for fundamental law. Mm -hmm. She has taken that at the university, and she did very well. And then she has studied uh, art, science, and. Uh, she has did, she did that very well. So she has a full university uh, study there. But she wants to continue with, uh, would you say, ethnology in English? Mm -hmm. Yes. So she she has done very well until now, and with good marks, and uh, and she is continuing. And uh, so we'll see what she what you will end with, but... Um, and do you believe that your son, as well as your youngest daughter, are relieved that they do not have to succeed their father? We never discussed it if they are relieved or not. But um, we know, and they know, that uh, there are only three in Sweden who can understand the situation. You know, and that they have to to be with their sister to 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 be of help. There are only three, and I think that's something which they know and which they are going to to have in their hearts and and help her. Thank you very much indeed.